excited to be here. I realise that some of you will have seen me come out with a microphone uh, may have become concerned. Oh God, Asian comedian. It's going to be banging on about being Asian the whole time. Please don't worry, uh, only about 10% of my stuff is based on me being Asian. All right? Uh, the other 90% is based on my issues with white people. Uh, <laughs> so it should be absolutely fine looking around. I can't help feeling there's been a bit of a booking error. Uh, but I'm just going <laughs> to say what I've got to say and get the hell out of here. Um, I am actually married. I don't want to upset anyone in here. Uh, I am married. <laughs> My wife and I have two small children. We're not kidnappers. Uh, <laughs> we created these children by the traditional means. Uh, adoption. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. I did it, did it. Uh, smashed it. Uh, and, um... <laughs> My wife is white. I'm genuinely Asian. I haven't just browned up for tonight's show. Uh, and so... <laughs> Our children are mixed race, and a game that we've started playing is we've started getting our kids to pick a side. <laughs> so whenever we're watching the Jeremy Kyle show, <laughs> just point at the screen and go, that's white people for you kids, isn't it? <laughs> I have got no idea, mate. <laughs> and whenever we go to an Indian restaurant, my wife will go, smells like daddy. <laughs> It's a little game we like to play. Uh, she won that one. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, I've overreacted to racism in the past. I'm not going to lie. I was getting my hair cut. It was an extremely hot day. I was complaining about how hot it was. This guy sitting in the bar as he turns to me, he says, oh, I can't believe you lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you lot. You come over here, did you, eh? <laughs> yeah, you do. You come over here, then you complain about how bloody hot it is, didn't you, son? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God. I'm going to put this idiot in his place, assuming that I'm an immigrant. So I said to him, well, actually, sir, the climactic conditions in Crawley, where I originated from, are <laughs> very similar to the ones that we're experiencing here. <laughs> 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 Just goes to show you. To which his genuine response was, bloody hell, mate, you're picking up the language brilliantly, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you, I recently came to the realisation that sometimes a lack of racism can actually be more hurtful than racism itself. Now, hear me out on this. I think you will agree with me. I recently got into a bit of a car prang, completely my fault, damaged this guy's car quite badly, he lost his shit as they had every right to, right, gets out of the car, he looks at me and he says, what the hell do you think you're doing, you fat bastard? <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God. I have put on so much weight. <laughs> That's the first thing he went for. Right? <laughs> I would rather he'd have said something racist, right? Because it's offensive, but at least it means I'm in shape. <laughs> I was sitting at home watching television with my wife the other day, and for those of you that have children, you will know to even get to a point where you're able to watch what you want to on television is a bloody miracle, right? You've got to deal with what these little shits want to do first, right? <laughs> And on this particular day, they wanted to watch Disney DVDs. I just about managed to convince them to not watch Finding Nemo. Now, I know that sounds mad, because Finding Nemo is a great film. I assume people are fans of it in here. It's a lovely movie. This fish goes along and saves his son. It's wonderful, heartwarming. Unfortunately, when you have children, that film is ruined. Right, because I'm watching Finding Nemo now, and I'm thinking to myself, I mean, he told Nemo. Repeatedly. <laughs> to stop pissing around, right? Because <laughs> Nemo wouldn't listen. He's got to go dicking across the other side of the world to go and get him. <laughs> and at the end of the film,
film, Nemo's dad's supposed to learn a lesson about chilling out. Piss off. <laughs> directing that film, Nemo would have got kidnapped and his dad would have gone, I told you, you little prick. <laughs> Enjoy the fish tank, dickhead. <laughs> and then the sequel would have been called Grounding Nemo. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, the fact of the matter is I don't, I don't actually like going out with my children. And it's not because of my children. I love my children, I think. The problem <laughs> is... You have to deal with other people's children and you have to deal with their parents. And you can't tell off other people's kids. Because people get annoyed, except I found a way. I was at the cinema a while ago, I'm going to share this with you. This kid was throwing popcorn about, shouting, just being a little idiot. <laughs> His parents were doing absolutely nothing about it. So I thought I would step up <laughs> on behalf of the cinema. So I got in real close and said, listen here, little shit. <laughs> Pull that again, I'm going to punch you in your face. Do you understand me? <laughs> And then as his parents approached and were able to hear me, I just went, and that's why you shouldn't say that to brown people. <laughs> they apologised to me. Right? <laughs> Try it, you'll have to brown up, but it's worth it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you genuinely have been um, adequate. So thank you so much. Good evening, Hammersmith Apollo. How are we doing? We good? I'm hosting this bitch. Uh, nice to be here, man. Nice to be here. Uh, I'm very excited. I'm really excited, man. I'll be honest, I'm a bit tired. I am tired, man. I'll tell you why. A few months ago, my wife gave birth to our third child. Well, thank you very much, but um, I don't know if I want a third child or not. <laughs> it's just too many, isn't it? I know it's late in the day to be having doubts, but... <laughs> Jesus Christ, there's too many people in the world. <laughs> well, I've had another one. Has anyone here got more than two kids? <laughs> See what I mean? It's a mistake. What a massive error, man. But what can you do? You can't kill him. <laughs> just got to sit there and wait to die. Just, uh, <laughs> happiness is gone, man. I'm just going to wait for this to end, I think. First kid's lovely. The second one's a prick. That, that, that's the only <laughs> truth of it. What an unacceptable human being this little arsehole is. I mean... We're doing these behaviour charts, man. You know where they get stickers for if they're good? The first one, he's so lovely. Hello, Daddy. <laughs> How can I help you, Daddy? <laughs> Love you, Daddy. <laughs> so we've got targets for him to get stickers, like be good today, be helpful to your friends. The second one, you can't have those targets, man. You've got to, you've got to ratchet the targets down for this arsehole. <laughs> You've got to have things like, don't burn anything. <laughs> no knife crime. These are, the t <laughs> these are the targets you've got to have for this shithead. Anyway, he got to a point where he managed to get five stickers. Not that impressive, it's over a six-month period, right? <laughs> but he got five stickers, and I said to him, right, we can get you a couple of things, mate. Go buy you a couple of presents. Went down to the shop. He chose two things. He chose a Spider-Man costume, and he chose a little pushchair with a little doll in it. I said to him, you can have both those things. The problem was is that he wanted to use those things at the same time. <laughs> so the next time I went out with him, we're down the park with this kid with a Spider-Man costume, pushing a pushchair, looking like a father for justice. <laughs> Just a horrendous little tribute act. But it does, it does make you worry, you know. It makes you worry, am I a good enough person to have kids? I don't know. I'm trying to get more intellectual. Started to read articles and stuff, trying to be more newsy, get more newsy, get more clued up about stuff. I read this article recently about rap music. I'm a massive rap fan. Are there rap fans in? <laughs> Big up yourselves, yeah? <laughs> I'm a massive rap fan. I was reading this article. It said that rap music can perpetuate negative stereotypes about black people. Because if you don't know any black people, then you watch a Snoop Dogg video. Apparently you think all black people are like that. 
this very interesting article also made me realise that I have 100% contributed to racism throughout my life. And I'll tell you why. I'm such a grumpy prick when I'm out and about that if you bumped into me and you were on the fence about Asians, <laughs> I reckon I'd push you over. <laughs> I think I'm part of the problem because white people, you don't realise how lucky you are. If one of you is a prick to me, I just think you're a prick. I don't think all white people are pricks. I'm a bloody representative. <laughs> Your interactions with me determine how you feel about brown people. It's all right if I'm in London, there's enough browns to balance it out, right? But if I'm in bloody Devon, <laughs> I've got to behave like I'm C-3PO. <laughs> no, sir, I'm not a local. You know, uh... And the truth is, I don't get that much racism. I get funny shit. I'll get, like, an older guy come up to you and go, do you know what? You're one of the good ones. <laughs> and I think that's funny. I've got no issue with that. I think if you've got an issue with that, you need to get the chip off your shoulder. Do you know what I mean? If you're older and you grew up in a time when it's all right to say stuff like that, and then times move on and you're not politically correct anymore, that's not your bloody fault. I think if you're older, you should just be given a card that says I can call you what I want. Because <laughs> older people got enough shit to worry about without worrying about being politically correct, haven't they? Got a false hip, I pissed myself this morning. <laughs> now you're telling me I can't say darky. Yeah. <laughs> I'm quite happy if I bump into an older person just to give them the old wobble head to make them feel comfortable, James. <laughs> Thank you very much, then, my brother. But, but, ding, ding, 299. It's just a sign of respect. <laughs> I, started to, I did start to get worried, though, because I was sort of thinking, in the run-up to the last election, UKIP was starting to get popular. And I was thinking, oh, God, what does that mean for my family? And then I realised I don't actually know anything about UKIP. So I thought, oh, you know, I'll go check it out, see what they're all about. I went to the website. Do you know what? It's a nice website. <laughs> Easy to navigate menus. <laughs> I thought, this is all right, I'm on board with this. Started looking at the policies. Started thinking, do you know what? I don't know if I disagree with a lot of this. <laughs> I want to take tax off the minimum wage. I'm in total agreement. Got to the end of it and I thought, holy shit. I think I might be UKIP. <laughs> I got on the phone to my mum. I said to her, mum, what have you really contributed? <laughs> and do you know what? I wasn't that happy with her answers. So that's the honest truth of it. <laughs> She might have to go. <laughs> My mum, she actually, um, she doesn't think I'm a proper Asian. It's <laughs> a sad thing about it. My mum calls me a coconut. <laughs> Don't know if you've heard this term, brown on the outside, white on the inside. So mum calls me, you're coconut. And, <laughs> The reason my mum calls me a coconut is because I'm originally Sri Lankan, my mother tongue is Tamil, I can't speak it. And the reason I can't speak it is because my mum and dad never spoke it to me when I was growing up, and now I don't know it, <laughs> and my mum blames me. Uh, <laughs> so she goes to me, I don't know you want about, why don't you know? <laughs> and then we'll go out. And my mum will slag me off to her Sri Lankan friends in front of me, like I don't know what's going on. Do you know what I mean? But coconut, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I get the gist. Then she try to code that shit up so I don't understand. But I know what a bounty is. Kinder surprise or whatever. All right, man. <laughs> I worry about lots of things, you know. Getting older, I started to worry about the end of the world. There's lots of signs of the end of the world, aren't there? You know, these diseases are one of them. Another one is a uh, goggle box. <laughs> it's definitely the end of the world, isn't it? People are watching people watch television. 
Does that not feel like the end of the world to you? Does anyone here watch Gogglebox? Yeah, it should be executed. But I, I, I can't believe this TV programme exists, man. It, I can't believe it. What a damning indictment of every other piece of television that's being made. Do you know what I mean? Can you imagine you poured your heart and soul into some drama? And then you say, how's the drama doing in the ratings? Not that well, mate. What's it being beaten by? It's being beaten by some people that are watching the drama. <laughs> what a kick in the dick. <laughs> that is. And listen, I don't deny it's entertaining, Apollo. I don't deny it's entertaining watching Gogglebox, but the problem is it puts you under pressure in your own house. It puts you under pressure, man. I don't want to have performance anxiety before I watch television. Because I'll sit down to watch TV, we'll flick it on, Gogglebox is on, they're all like banter, 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 and then my wife will turn to me and go, why is it not like this? <laughs> when we watch TV, I'll tell you why it's not this, because we switch this on so I don't have to talk to you. That's the whole... <laughs> That's the whole point of television. This has died, let's switch this on. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I've got my phone here, you're literally third in line in terms of my level of attention. I'm addicted to my phone, man. I'm addicted to my phone. Are there any iPhone users in? Any Android phone users in? Yeah, I've got a problem with you. What a self-satisfied, smug bunch of pricks you are. Oh, my God. Aren't they proud of themselves that they've got an Android phone? Have you got an iPhone? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm not a sheep. I think I'll make up my own mind about what phone I buy. Thank you very much. You haven't unplugged from the Matrix, all right? <laughs> you're not off the grid because you bought a Samsung, all right? <laughs> it's a massive corporation. It's not a little family-owned business. Two brothers, Sam and Sung, decide to set up a little market store <laughs> and knock out phones. <laughs> you're not better than me, all right? And they love talking about the battery life. Oh, my God. I imagine you're looking for a plug point. <laughs> Shut up, mate. <laughs> the shit battery life on smartphones is the best thing about them, because when the battery runs out, then I'll interact with my kids, right? Because <laughs> I've got no willpower. I'll be down in the park, I'm like, oh, that's run out. Better find out where they're going with those old men. The phone companies have got to admit that they've made the phones too good. They have to admit it, they're too good for humans. They are, they're too good, because I'll be out with my wife and she'll say to me, why are you constantly, you're constantly, you're constantly on the phone? You're constantly on the phone. Why not, madam? <laughs> I've got a little box here that can access any website, I can play games, I can watch films. Why the fuck would I want to hear about your rash? But there is... <laughs> There is nothing you can say to me that can compete with this. I'm watching Game of Thrones. Say something better than that. <laughs> I'll give you a chance now. <laughs> Welcome to Noel at the Apollo. Yes, mate. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Well, I'm Hindu, uh, but thank you so much for the sentiment. Such an honour to be hosting uh, the Christmas Live at the Apollo, and you sort of think, well, how have I got to this point? I just want to give thanks to diversity quotas. You know, it's <laughs> really helped me out. You're getting two for one with me because I'm Asian and I've got a lazy eye. So what you get is... <laughs> You get ethnicity and you get disability. <laughs> I do like Christmas. I like to play the race card at Christmas. What's good about it is that you can make anyone feel racist at Christmas. It's a really nice little tradition I like to do. If somebody comes up to you and says, Merry Christmas, you go, why would you assume that I celebrate Christmas? Right? <laughs> and if they come up to you and go, Merry Christmas, oh no, do you celebrate? You go, why would you assume that I don't celebrate Christmas? <laughs> It's wicked, man. I love it. 
Or sometimes I like to knock on a neighbour's door and go, here's your Christmas card, notice you didn't get me one for Diwali. See you later. <laughs> it's nice, it's nice. Obviously, it's difficult for us at our house with Christmas and that because, uh, well, I can't pretend to be Santa. because of the lazy eye. It just makes it such a nightmare. The kids don't know which one I'm giving the present to. It's just... <laughs> it's absolutely My wife always wants to go away for Christmas, right? Last Christmas, she wanted to do Disneyland Paris. Has anyone been there? Yeah. Yeah. I liked it. I found it difficult to engage with it fully because it was so expensive. It's very difficult to fully enjoy it when you know how much you've paid to get your family in there. Like, my kids were walking around just like all the visions of Christmassy Disney, and I just had, in my eyes, the invoice. Do you know what I mean? I was just... <laughs> For me, Disneyland Paris is basically like a three-day angry walk. Do you know what I mean? Just wandering around, <laughs> going, fuck off, Donald! Do you know what I mean? just, <laughs> just furious, so angry. It's the first time I really thought about learning another language, right? Because... They all speak French, obviously. We're in France. I'm not so post-Brexit that they can't speak their own language in their own country. But I'm a very paranoid dude. We're queuing up for the Tower of Terror with my eldest son, just about to get on the ride. The guy behind the counter turns to his mate and goes, I was thinking, what the shit did that dude just say, man? And in my head, I'm thinking he must have gone, I think the roller coaster is broken. Let's just try that one more time on this prick and his son. <laughs> He probably just said, I fancy a sandwich. I, I don't know, but I'm very <laughs> The kids were very excited, right? They're excited, because how it works is you pay a lot of money to get in so that you can access some shops where you spend some more money, right? That's how it works. <laughs> the kids are like, <laughs> we're going to buy loads of stuff. I said, no, no, you're not, mate. You're allowed one present each, yeah? Because Daddy has been fisted by Mickey here, right? So... <laughs> you get one present each, all right? No messing about. The little one... Well, the thing is, I actually made an extra saving because I've got a seven-year-old, a five-year-old and a two-year-old. The two-year-old doesn't know what's going on, so sack him off. Jimmy, I, I, just gave him, I just gave him a croissant we got free at the hotel. There you go, man. <laughs> thank you, Daddy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, enjoy, dickhead. But... <laughs> the eldest one, he chose... Uh, he chose a Jedi cloak with Mickey. He's into Star Wars. I mean, not properly. He doesn't know the mythology properly, but he, he is into Star Wars. Right? He chose a Jedi cloak with Mickey ears on it, right? Now, immediately, I can feel tension in here. <laughs> he was wearing it around the house. One of my mates went, It's disgusting. It's disgusting. It's exactly why I didn't want them taking over Star Wars, because of things like this. I was thinking, what is your problem, dude? What are you concerned about? Are you worried that Star Wars is going to become commercial? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Were you watching Jar Jar Binks and thinking, no, this is still cutting edge? And it was <laughs> the Mickey ears that pushed you over. Was it really? My, my second son, he chose, uh, he chose a, a radio-controlled car. Fine. Get back to England. So frustrating how shit this kid is at driving the car, man. Like, <laughs> he's knocking into coffee tables, he's hitting my ankles, he's hitting the skirt. But I said to him, dude, a kid of your age, Made that. <laughs> you can't even drive it, you prick. <laughs> Unbelievable, this kid. They've just, uh, my two older ones have just started school. I think school is the earliest point at which I care what my kids have been up to. Because like, when my son was at nursery, I used to go pick him up from nursery and the girl at work in there would go, great day today, great day today, great day, great day. Would you like to your daily report of what he's been up to? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. <laughs> what could he possibly have done that I would care about? Let me guess. <laughs> he dropped some stuff and he shit himself, right? <laughs> uh, that's what he does at home. Unless he's built a shed, I, I really couldn't care less. In fact, I resent the fact we're having a conversation. That's the honest truth of it. <laughs> Difficult. It's difficult for teachers. I, I respect teachers, you know, and I, they get all these Christmas presents and, they, and people say, oh, we've got to buy presents for our teachers. Good. Teachers deserve it, mate. 
Do you mean, I used to be a teacher, it's boring. I mean, it's liberating once you stop caring about the kids' futures, then, then it becomes a, a wonderful, wonderful job. But you have to do boring stuff. We had to do exam invigilation, right? This is where the kids are sitting in a hall doing an exam, and you've got to walk around pretending that you're interested <laughs> and you're worried about them cheating, so you just... <laughs> Sometimes I would do this, right? <laughs> Good luck, mate. <laughs> Just add a little spice to proceedings. It was very boring, though. I had to find a way of passing the time. The way that I did it is I played Battleship. Now, how this would work was I'd get a piece of paper and I'd write down on the piece of paper the name of the kid that I thought was the ugliest in the room. <laughs> or the kid that I thought had the shittest haircut. Then the other teacher would walk through the hall. and they would stop by the kid that they thought I was talking about. <laughs> and if they got it correct, then they'd sunk my battleship. It, it, it was a very fun game. <laughs> it's now been made illegal in West Sussex, sadly. <laughs> I just find it, I, I find it exciting. My kids get so excited about Christmas, and I sort of feel, I get caught up in, you know, what's, what does the future hold for them, and are they going to follow their dreams? And, and then I realise that Christmas TV, it just... I disagree with it, right? I disagree with this. Ch I actually disagree with chasing your dreams. I actually disagree with it. If there's any message you get from this, don't chase your dreams, right? <laughs> Life is not about chasing your dreams. Life is about compromising your ideals and waiting to die. That, that's what <laughs> life is about. Right? You know, like, I just think teachers get a hard time. I think they get a hard time about this, right? Because somebody like Justin Bieber will win an award, right? And then he'll come out and he'll go, um, just want to say, this is for the teachers that said I was never going to do it. Yeah? Do you know why your teachers said you were never going to do it, Justin? Do you know how statistically unlikely it is for you to achieve the outcomes that you have done? Yeah? Especially bearing in mind what a bell end you must have been as a kid, right? <laughs> do you know how unlikely it is? How irresponsible a careers advisor would you have to be? To say to a kid, you know what, mate, you need to stop studying, you're going to be the number one recording artist in the whole world. <laughs> if my kid came home and said that that's what has been told to him by a school, I would go to that school and I'd burn it to the fucking ground. <laughs> right? I want to see the other way. I want to see a teacher who's told a kid he wouldn't amount to shit and he didn't come out and admit it. Right? I, I want to see him brought out on TV just going, this is for Mrs Clerkenwell. She said I was never going to do anything with my life and I just wanted to come out here and say, I haven't, you know, like, <laughs> I've got nothing really going on, uh, free felt marriages behind me, I'm wearing everything I own, I just want to say, she said I was going to be a waste of space and it turns out I have been, so, uh, <laughs> this is my teacher that said I wasn't going to amount to anything, yeah, that's what I want to see. Because chasing dreams is a nightmare, it's a nightmare, like, and people who are doing regular, decent jobs get disrespected, that's what annoys me, like, you see it on X Factor, X Factor, right, when these people get through to the live rounds, right, they, they take them back to their old place of work, which is a perfectly decent job. They'll take this bloke back, he'd go to Tesco's or something, sees his mate working on fruit and veg, who he used to work with, and he'll go, that's Pete, he used to work with him. <laughs> you know, the thought of having to go back <laughs> and do that ever again just makes me want to kill myself, you know. <laughs> See you later, Pete. Pete's just over here, like... I just like bananas. You know what I don't <laughs> understand is that being famous is fine, but don't pretend it's noble. It's not a noble ambition, right? It's vacuous. So just admit that. X Factor, they try and add something. They try and add some substance to it. Like you see, they give them backstory so that you go, oh my God, they've got to do it. You'll see somebody go, oh, you know, well, just, I just really want to make it through because my brother's got cancer and he said that one of his like, dying wishes would be to see me go through to the live rounds. And I think, well, that is very noble, isn't it? Because I would have assumed that one of his last dying wishes would be to get better. Right, but this guy uh, is willing to sacrifice that so that you can make it through to Louis' six chairs. I mean, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Things like that irritate me. Little things like that irritate me. You know, I got, 
I got given an Iggy Azalea album. Right? That irritates me. <laughs> Are there any fans of Iggy Azalea in? This is my problem with Iggy Azalea. She's a white Australian. She's a white Australian and she's rapping like a black woman from the south and it's illegal. <laughs> How is it legal? I don't understand. Do you, she doesn't... She, she doesn't, it's not like Eminem. Eminem raps how he talks. Iggy Azalea talks like this, hello mate, I'm Iggy. And then when she raps, she puts on, she does an impression of a black woman from the deep south. They record that and they sell it and it's okay. She's doing an impression, do you understand what I'm saying to you? She's doing an impression of a black woman. Do you get what I'm saying? Iggy Azalea is a minstrel that couldn't be asked to black up. That's what Iggy Azalea is. My brother said to me, I'm overreacting. He goes to me, you're overreacting, mate. It's hip-hop. She can't make an Australian accent. Would it be authentic? Would it be authentic? <laughs> I don't buy that as an argument, you know? If you went to an Indian restaurant and the waiter was white and for a little bit of authenticity... He said, would he like a bobber dom? You wouldn't accept that, would you?